and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. All right, I want to begin here in Acts chapter number 13. Look with me at verse number 46. Verse number 46, the Bible says this. <clears throat> then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of the salvation of the Gentiles. The salvation of the Gentiles. Now this is a subject that has layers of confusion. There are multiple doctrines that are false doctrines that are held within Christian churches today that are all attached to this one individual doctrine. It's actually a very simple subject that has become extremely inflated and confusing to many people. I'm going to begin this morning by defining terms according to the Bible. And this is where many Baptist churches, many Bible believers have a major error in their understanding is by defining the word Gentile. I want you to turn with me to Malachi chapter number 1 verse number 11. Malachi chapter number 1 verse number 11. While you're turning there also I want to clarify something uh, that is also tied in with this and as I was saying there are many false doctrines that are attached to this and that is that salvation has always been the same salvation has always been the same now I mean that in two in two ways there are two ways where we can apply that statement Salvation has always been the same in every period of time, in every era, in every generation. Everyone has always been saved the same way, and that is by faith. By faith. The Bible says that Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That is the same gospel that we preach today. It's the same gospel that was preached unto the Gentiles here. It is the same gospel. There's one gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. That is it. One gospel. Not only that, Jews and Gentiles have always been saved the same. Everyone has always been saved the same. And even still today that applies. Everyone is saved the same today. I want to also begin by, by explaining uh, what a Jew is. There is a lot of confusion about what a Jew is or what a Hebrew is or what an Israelite is when it comes to the Bible. A Jew is not a Jewish person that is not <coughs> excuse me an ethnicity when we read in the Bible a person that is a Jew is a person that is a part of the nation of Israel an Israelite is a person that was of the nation of Israel it is not a specific ethnicity nor is it a specific race now this can be proven by one simple verse a very a very profound verse a lot of people may read over but it says this in Esther chapter number 8 verse number 17 and in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And then it says this, and many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, is ethnicity something that you can change? If we were to talk of, let's say, race or something like that, right? The lineage or the line that you came down is that something that you can just alter, you know, on a dime or change on a dime? No. You know, you know, like the Bible says, you know, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can, a, can the leopard change his spots? That's not something that we can just change. Jesus talks about how you can't make one of your hairs white or black, right? You can't change your skin color. You can't change who you are. It's just who you are, right? Nor could people change the lineage or the line that they were here that were, when it's speaking of the, uh, those that were Jews, right? Those that were, let's say, of the line of Abraham, if we were to speak in the sense of ethnicity. So is this specifically talking about an ethnical thing or a line or a lineage? 
No, it is not. Because what does it say? It says that they became Jews. What does that mean? That they converted over or they changed over to the nation of, Jew, of the Jews or the nation of Israel. Now, it's this simple. When, when Moses stood there and made the covenant with Israel, what did he say that they were going to be unto God? A holy nation, a peculiar people. The Jews were Israel in the Old Testament. They were a nation of people. It was not a specific race. It was not a specific ethnicity. It was a nation. That's why here it says that people became Jews. This verse right here, it's game over. This is all that's needed. It's such a powerful verse that you can just, on a dime, you can become a Jew. You cannot change your ethnicity, my friend. So that proves that it is talking about a nation. Now that ties in a lot with what a Gentile is. And you have to understand that first, that a Jew is someone that is of the nation of Israel. I want you to look here at Malachi chapter <coughs> number 1. Verse number 11, it says this, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going <coughs> down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. There we see a, a hint or an allusion to the salvation of the Gentiles, by the way. But keep reading, it says this, And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen. Now right there we see the Gentile being used interchangeable with what? The heathen, right? We're gonna be we're gonna get more of a specific answer. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number six, verse number thirty-two. <coughs> so we see a Gentile is a heathen. Now, who was the people of God? Or who who was the nation of God? Israel, right? So anyone that was not of the nation of God, wouldn't it make sense that they would be called a heathen? Wouldn't that make perfect sense? Now think about this. Again, we, I want you to understand the point that I'm debunking right now very clearly is that being a Jew is not a race. It, is not, it does not mean that you are of a certain race. It means that you are of a certain nation when it comes to the Bible's words and the Bible's terms when it's talking about being a Jew. We saw that they became Jews. Now could a, a person that is of another nation could they become a Jew and stop being a heathen? Of course. How do we use the word heathen today? We talk about a person that is a heathen is someone that is not of God. So doesn't that make perfect sense that anyone that would be of another nation not serving God, that they would be a heathen? That is actually what the word Gentile means. It was a person that was not of the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel was the nation of God. Therefore, all other nations were Gentiles or they were heathens. It is a word to refer to all nations of the world. I'm going to prove that to you here. You're in Matthew 6.32. I'm going to read to you from Luke 12.30. Now I want you to read Matthew 6.32 in your mind while I'm reading Luke 12.30. It says this, For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So did you notice that? What, the word, uh, what word was substituted there when you read Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32, while I was reading Luke 12, 30? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. These gospels are, are basically the same stories. They are just different records or from different angles. The same records, different angles of the same record of what's occurring or what's taking place, right? We see a word that is used synonymous here in Matthew 6.32 and Luke 12.30 and it is Gentiles with the nations of the world. Do you know what that teaches you? That the nations of the world are Gentiles. Gentiles are the nations of the world. So two truths that we've learned so far that are very plain and very clear. Number one, a Jew is someone that is of the nation of Israel. This is why people that were of other nations could become a Jew. They became a part of that nation, right? That would mean that all other nations, what, are heathen. They are not of what? The holy nation. They are not of the people of God. That's why God referred to that, uh, the, the people of Israel as a holy nation because it is a nation. It is not a race. I know this may seem uh, redundant to you, but I want to pound this point in. A lot of people are confused about this. This may seem simple to you, but if you go into virtually any Christian church today, they're going to teach you something different to this. They're going to teach you that the Jews are all those that are of the lineage of the line and that were born forth from Abraham. They have this perfectly traced pure line that goes all the way back to Abraham. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Not even close. 
So you have the nation of God, the nation of Israel, and you have all the nations of the world. That's the, the perfect definition of it. All the nations of the world other than Israel. They are known as Gentiles and they are heathens as well because they are not of the nation of God. So there's our definition to Gentiles. This gives us a great starting point because we can define terms and understand what the Bible is teaching when it says Gentiles, right? Or when it says uh, um, Jews or it speaks of Israel. I want you to begin with me. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 17, verse number 26. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 17, verse number 26. So, so basically what we have today in the world is we have one race according to the Bible. But you know, we will try to divide people up into different races, but the Bible says that there's really only one race. That's the human race. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 17, verse number 26, look down there with me. And hath made, speaking of God, and hath made of one blood, watch this, all nations for to dwell on all the face of the earth. You know what that means? You have the Jews, which are what? A nation. And you know who else you have? The Gentiles, and the, which would also be known as the heathen. You know what that means? That the Gentiles and the heathens, that's, that, those are the nations of the world. And then also Israel, they are all of one blood. You know, there's no difference. That's what he's saying. Right. All the nations of the world, right? Israel and the Gentiles, they are all of one blood. People may try to divide everyone up into all of these different races, but the Bible does not teach that concept. Jesus, when he came, he quoted an Old Testament passage uh, from the book of Psalms. David was writing and he said that his house, talking about the house of God, was made a house of prayer to all nations. Amen. All nations. You know what that means? Gentiles and Israel, both. And people have this very weird concept when it comes to Gentiles, when it comes to anyone that is not of Israel. And their first mistake, and this is major, so I hope you caught that, is that they do not understand what it means to be a Jew in the first place. They don't even understand what the word Gentile means. This is rudimentary. This is very basic where the Bible defines these words for us. The nation of Israel, they are Jews. People could become a Jew. They could become an Israelite. Let that sink in. On a dime, they can convert to serving the God of Israel. They could become a part of that nation. And guess what they are? Hey, my fellow Jew. Hey, my fellow Israelite. They are now a Jew. They became Jews. That is very profound. And this should change many people's ways of looking at things when they read the Bible. When it talks about Israel, when it talks about the Jews. Who is everyone else? They're all Gentiles, right? Now, God, the Bible tells us right here that he made <coughs> all nations of one blood. You know what that tells me? That there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And the Greek, right? <clears throat> God loves the whole world. That's right. God loves everyone. They are, we're all precious in His sight. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. Man. The color of your skin matters as much as the color of your hair and the color of your eyes. It makes no difference. It does not matter at all, period. By, the, the Bible teaches very clearly that God loves everyone. You can prove this that in all nations, not just Israel, not just one specific nation. He loves all nations of the world. You can prove this backwards and forwards from so many different examples. I want, to, I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 24, verse number 47. Luke chapter number 24, verse number 47. <clears throat> John chapter number 3 verse number 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, that's anyone, Jew, Gentile, that's anyone, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it says, God, for God so loved the world. That's everyone, right? That's the entire world. This is the commandment here in Luke chapter number 24 before Jesus ascended into heaven that He gave unto His disciples. Notice what He says, Luke 24, 47. <clears throat> And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name, watch this, among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So notice that. You're going to start here in Jerusalem and then you know where you're going to go from there? You're going to go to all nations. Jesus Christ wanted every single nation to receive the gospel. He wanted every person that was dwelling in any, whatever nation it may be, 
to receive the good news of salvation, to receive the good news of the gospel, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. You'll see that again in Matthew 28, 19. I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 9. The Bible says this, The Lord is not... <coughs> Slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's not willing that any should perish. That's anyone, right? He wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19 says this. <clears throat> Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13. <coughs> <clears throat> all of these Baptists that, that, that go out soul winning all the time, you know what they use? The Romans road. The Romans road. A lot of them also will hold to these false doctrines. Even fellow Baptists, the false doctrines that is, where they'll teach that the nation of Israel is greater than all other nations on the earth. And that maybe in the Old Testament, even to become, even to be saved, you had to convert to being a Jew. And even then, they'll teach that. And I've heard this so many times, that they were like a second-class citizen. That's not the God of the Bible. That is not the attitude or the personality of the God of the Bible that we see anywhere, ever in the Bible. They go to Romans 10, 13, and I, I've been with so many Baptists that will hold to this teaching of, you know, Israel and the Gentile and this, this Jewish supremacy type, type of teaching. But look here what's smashed so close next to Romans chapter number 10, 13. So Romans 10, 13, of course, is for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We saw, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Well, what does that whosoever mean? Let's look at verse number 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what the, the whosoever means? It means whosoever. It means all, right? Sometimes you'll, have, you'll, you'll argue with people and they don't understand that and they'll try to redefine terms like, well, all, like a Calvinist especially, all doesn't really mean all or whosoever doesn't really mean whosoever. You know what whosoever means? It means Jew and Greek. Do you know who the Greeks were? The Gentiles were? They were just everybody else. When you read in Romans chapter number one, it'll say the Jew and the Gentile and then you know what it'll say? The Jew and the Greek. So you know what it's using there? Greek and Gentile interchangeable. What's the Gentile? All the nations of the world. So you know what the Greek is? All the nations of the world. He's saying everyone. The nation of Israel and then everyone else. Anyone in the whole world that calls upon the name of the Lord. Anyone. If they call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter number <coughs> 26, verse number 23. We're going to look at some... Uh, some New Testament examples of salvation here in just a moment. I want to show you <coughs> that Paul the Apostle understood this very clearly. He understood that, that God wanted everyone to be saved and that God cared about the Gentile just as much as he did the Jew. Look at Acts chapter number 26, verse number 23. I don't think that these Baptists understand how they sound when they stand up and they teach that God has just this special heart for these other people. And if he had to choose anyone to be saved, well, he wants to make sure that the Jew gets salvation first. He wants to make sure that the Jew is saved first. That is not the God of the Bible. That is disgusting. That is, that is weird. It's a perverted, you know, just, just, just twisted version of who God is. It's disgusting is who it is. You know what that makes God? A respecter of persons. You know what you see all the time, all throughout the Bible? God is not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care whether you're Jew, you're Greek, you're white, you're black, you're red, you're yellow. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God at all. He loves all and he wants everyone to be saved. Look at Acts chapter number 26, <coughs> verse number 23. The Bible says this, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So notice that. Unto the people and to the Gentiles. Go to Acts chapter 28, verse number 28. <coughs> 
Now, throughout the Old Testament, Israel was given certain benefits or certain advantages. Now, there's a difference between a benefit and a privilege, right? Does everyone understand the difference between a benefit and a privilege? You can be born with certain benefits, but that doesn't mean that you just automatically receive a privilege, like, oh, I just get salvation. Those are two totally different things. So the Jew, because they had the scriptures, because they were given you know, certain advantages of being the holy nation, they had these certain benefits. But that doesn't mean that other people could not acquire to these privileges, that other people could not get you know, uh, uh, the privilege of having salvation, right? Those are two totally different things. Now, in the Old Testament, they were the holy nation of God. And this is another error. Like I said, there's a few false doctrines that tie in with this one teaching. Th this is another error that many Baptists have. In the, did you notice what I said a moment ago? In the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant, Israel was the nation of God. You know what that means? Yeah, you heard me right. Israel is not the nation of God today. They are not the nation of God. The Bible teaches very plainly. Jesus said unto the, the, the Antichrist Jews, he said, the kingdom shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. When he tells the, the parable about you know, the prophets or the men being sent into the vineyard, he explains it and he says, those men are the prophets. And then he says, and last of all, he sent his son. Do you know what their last opportunity was? When the son of God came. All throughout the Old Testament, you know how you have the Jews doing? Taking the prophets and killing them. Abel to Zacharias. They're killing the prophets repeatedly over and over and over again. You know what? They got one more chance. The son of God. Last of all, he sent his son. You know what they did with him? They killed him too. You know what the result of that was? The kingdom was taken from them and it was given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. We're told about what this nation is. It's a nation made up of all kindreds and peoples and tongues and nations. It is, it is a nation that is made up of all saved believers, all Christians all over the world. God cares about everyone and he... He wants all nations to be saved. He wants all nations to be saved. He's not this, this sadistic weirdo God that, that, that some people will try to create up or conjure up in their own mind. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 28, verse number 28 <coughs> says this. <coughs> be it known therefore unto you, <coughs> excuse me, that the salvation of God, <coughs> excuse me, is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. So there is no discussion of whether or not God wants the Gentiles or God wants the nations of the world to be saved. We can see repeatedly where this is taking place. Now I want to deal with something else as well because people will try to say, hey, well, what about the Old Testament? Maybe, so I see what you're saying in the New Testament. So over and over again, you know, all these people are getting saved in the New Testament. I mean, how could you deny salvation in the New Testament to the Gentiles? I mean, you could, half of the New Testament is written to Gentile churches, my friend. Half of inspired scriptures are written to Galatia. It's written to Galatia, Corinth, Colossus. Ephesus, all of these are Gentile church. And he, he tells you plainly that they're Gentiles in many of, the, the, of these books. It's very plain. It's very clear. I mean, you have Timothy. In Acts chapter number 16, he is said to be born of a Greek. Right. Timothy was, is, is, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are books that were written from Paul to Timothy as his proselyte in the faith. I mean, there are so many examples. One of Jesus Christ's disciples even. Simon the Canaanite. Cana is not Israel. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but the nation of Cana, that is a nation. They, that is, are the, yeah, the nation of Cana, that is not Israel. That is the, where Israel was located later, but the Canaanites were, were very wicked, evil people that God sent them in to destroy so the nation of Israel could have that. Well, some of them lingered afterwards. You know who one of them was? Simon the Canaanite. You know what happened? He became a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that is? Hey, I'm, I'm sorry to bust your Zionist bubble, but one of the 12 disciples was a Gentile, my friend. Amen. Think about that for a minute. I mean, this, this, this idea that the, that the Jews were just like this perfect line, this pure line, is so ridiculous. It shows that people are not reading the Bible for themselves. The book of Ruth, do you know what it's about? It's about a love story, right? Between Ruth and who? Boaz. Boaz. You know who Boaz is the father of? Jesus Christ. 
Do you know where Ruth is from? Moab. Ruth was a Moabitess. You know what that means? Jesus, in one sense, was a Moabite. Yeah, you know I'm mad that would make a lot of these Zionist Christians, but it's the Bible. The Bible's what's making them angry. Jesus came from the line of Moab also. And now on his mother's side, right there, where on his great, 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 great grandmother, she was a Moabite. She was a Moabite. Let that sink in. That, you know what that tells me? That God loves everyone. Amen. Even the Messiah of the world came from, yes, mainly Judah, the tribe of Judah. She became of the tribe of Judah and of the line of Abraham, of course. Do you know what he came from? Also from Gentile stock. He also came from Gentile stock. The flesh that the Savior had on this world, it was also, if you want to try to make it a race thing, it was also Gentile flesh, my friend. It was, think about that. It was also of the nations of the world. That's the God of the Bible. You know what that proves? It does, red and yellow, black and white, none of it matters to him at all. That's not what matters to him. <clears throat> I want you to go now to, uh, we're going to go look at, like I said, <coughs> some passages. First, first I want you to go <coughs> to Romans chapter number 9, verse number 23. I, I want you to see this a little bit more. Since we're close to here, we'll look at this passage. I was, I was thinking about skipping it, but let's go to Romans chapter number 9, verse number 23. <coughs> I didn't paste it, I just put it here because I was thinking about whether I was going to use it or not. But this is a good passage. What we can see, this has to do with Old Testament salvation of the Gentiles because it's actually a prophecy that is given in the New Testament, or that is quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament about salvation coming to the Gentiles. Now, we're going to, we'll just begin reading. Romans chapter number 9, verse number 23. I'll explain what I was going to explain in just a moment. Look at Romans chapter number 9, verse number 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now watch this. Verse 25. As he saith also in O.C. So what does that mean? Saying... Hosea, oh see there is Hosea in the book of Hosea, he said the same thing. Saying, as he said, said this same thing in the book of Hosea, right? <clears throat> I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. While we're here too, go over to Romans chapter number 10, the end of Romans chapter number 10. You may or may not have to turn depending on your Bible's format. But look there in Romans chapter number 10, we'll see the same thing being taught. Look at Romans 10 um, verse number 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth. Saying, everyone heard it. Talking about the Gentiles. That's the purpose of that. <clears throat> and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Now when he says foolish nation, he's talking about them because they are not an actual nation that is gathered together. Saying that it is a spiritual nation because they're all uh, scattered all throughout the world. That's what he means by foolish there. Look at verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. Talking about the Gentiles right now. I was manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That is the summary of the Old Testament Israel. They were a disobedient and gainsaying people. Look with me at um, Acts chapter number 15, verse number 16. Here's another prophecy from uh, the Old Testament that's quoted in the New Testament. <coughs> Acts chapter number 15, verse number 16. <clears throat> it says this, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works, watch this, from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which, are, which, from, the, uh, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter number 2, verse number 32. Now this is a... Uh, 
Extremely interesting. Actually, you go to Luke 4. I'll read you from Luke 2. Where I want you to go is Luke 4. <clears throat> Luke 2 says, A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You know who that's talking about? It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll see Jesus' opinion. Now, we already saw, number one, that Jesus said that he wanted his disciples to go where? To all the nations. and preach the gospel to every creature. So, that right there should be enough. That Jesus cares about all nations. Jesus died for who? Everyone, yeah. right? It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's the name of the Lord? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Just a few verses later, right? Yeah. Or earlier, I'm sorry. It tells you what that name is. It is Jesus. It says that he is rich. Talking about the Lord, it says that he is rich unto all that call upon him. Right? It's talking about the Jew and the Greek. So who we call upon? We're calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And who's he saving? Jew and Gentile. Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter. Either one. It doesn't make any difference to him. <clears throat> Look at Luke chapter number 4. I want you to, you may or may not have noticed uh, what was actually taking place here when Jesus uh, uh, stood up to read in, the, in the, the, the synagogues. This is a very profound story. But you, you may have missed one of the points that he's making, and what makes the Jews or what makes Israel so angry. I want you to look with me at Luke 4, verse 16. We're going to read down here through about 10 verses or so. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> and he came to Nazareth, of course Jesus that is, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. And on, I'm sorry, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. <clears throat> To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, now watch this. <clears throat> so they're like wondering at him. They're wondering, it says, at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they're like, is not this Joseph's son, right? And then he says this, watch this. And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb. Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever <coughs> we, have, we have heard done in Capernaum, do also hear in thy country. So when he says heal thyself, he's talking about like your own people, right? Like he's of that nation. Like heal your own kindred, right? Heal thyself. Whatsoever was done in Capernaum, like the great works, because of course Jesus goes forth, he's healing people, he's doing all types of great works. He says whatsoever was done in Capernaum. Now is Capernaum Israel? No, it's considered Gentiles, right? That's why he says whatsoever was done in Capernaum, do also here, saying to your people. Now watch what he says next. Verse 24, and he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own, look what it says, country. What does that mean? His own nation. Right. Notice again, what's the difference? They're nations. It has nothing to do with race. But furthermore, this is what I want you really to look at. <coughs> Verse 25. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elias. He's saying just like how there are many people in Israel at his time, right? When there, Elijah was a man that was sent from God. Jesus, being God, of course, was a man that was sent from God. God in the flesh, just like Elias was. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, uh, when great famine was throughout all the land. Watch this. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon. Unto a woman that was a widow. Do you understand his point? Saying that when, the, when Elias was sent, when God had somewhere for him to go, do you know where he went? Not to Israel. He went to a woman of Sarepta. It's Zarephath in the Old Testament. Sarepta. A woman that was a widow there. So what's his point? What's he saying to them? He, in, this, in this particular situation, he's saying, hey, he, he's proving this. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. God doesn't care more for you than he cares for the rest of the world. This is the attitude that the Jews had. Do you remember what John the Baptist said when the Pharisees were coming unto him? He already knew because that's how they were. They treated all other nations bad. When the Pharisees were coming, he said, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Do you know why? Because they thought that they were better than everybody else because they had what? Abraham to their father. Why is Jesus explaining this? Because the, the Israelites, those that were of the nation of Israel, even at that time, thought were better than all the nations of the world. And what is Jesus explaining? Hey, let me give you an example. When there was a man of God and there was a prophet of God, where God didn't even send him unto Israel. Do you know where he sent him? He sent him to a Gentile. Look next. Look at verse 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha. That's Elisha. So the first one was Elijah. This is the New Testament rendering of Elisha. Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Do you know what he's further talking about right now? The fact that, hey, let me give you another example. Let me give you another example. When God had a man of God, and he was going to do something great for people, and in this particular case, you know what he did? It was all these people in Israel. Those, look, notice how he points out, he says, and many lepers were in Israel. So it was a lot of other lepers. But God chose, hey, I want you to go to this Syrian here. Do you know why? Do you know why he chose? Was it because he was a Syrian? That Naaman was a Syrian? No. His point is that neither one matters, my friend. That had nothing to do with it. It wasn't whether or not he was a Syrian or a Jew or an Israelite. That did not matter at all to God. God loves everyone. That's the point that he's trying to make. He's actually speaking to people that think that they are greater than all other nations. And he's proving to them, hey, let me give you some examples where God actually wanted to heal the Gentiles, when he could have healed many people in Israel, he chose just to heal a Gentile. Look at what it says in verse 28, how they acted. Just to prove that, that this made them angry and that, they, and that th he was rebuking them for their Jewish supremacy. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Why would they be angry about that? Why would that make them angry? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that you could be happy for other people being healed? Wouldn't you think that you should be happy that other people are being healed? Do you know why? Because he's telling them, hey, you're not any better than anyone else. You're not any Let me give you examples of where God had a man of God who was doing great works. He was, doing, he was performing miracles and God wanted to bestow this miraculous work upon a Gentile and not upon an Israelite. Upon what they would consider a heathen, one of the nations of the world, and not upon a Jew. You know what his point is to them? You know what's making them so angry? Because they thought they were better than all of the other nations of the world. They thought they were greater than all the other people of the world and that God just esteemed them higher and exalted there. And they thought it was a race thing. Exalted their race higher than all of the other races of the world. That is garbage. And that is not what the Bible teaches anywhere. God loves everyone, no matter your skin color, no matter, even, it doesn't matter even your nation or your country. Amen. It doesn't matter even slightly. And you have these stinking, of course I have to mention it, these black Hebrew Israelites who are a bunch of morons, where, where they try to take the Bible and they try to act like they believe the Bible. They try to act like, hey, you know, we believe the scripture we're the, we're the chosen of God because we are Israel. Hey, even if you were Israel, which you are not, my friend, that doesn't matter even slightly. The Bible says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. It doesn't matter at all. Even if you were of the, of the line of Abraham, do you know what John the Baptist would say to you? Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Do you know what Jesus would say to you? You know, there was many lepers. There was, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian Israelite. Let that sink in. These bunch of stinking fools. You know where they got the, all of this, this ridiculous teaching from? That they're, you know, uh, uh, the chosen people of God. Obviously, YouTube. But they stole it from, from false Christianity. False Christianity teaches that Israel <coughs> is a special people that's higher than all of the... Obviously, they don't think that it's the black Hebrew Israelites. They would say that it's just the, those that were in Europe and went back to Israel. They, they, they believe that those people are special above all the people of the earth. They believe that. 
that they are greater than all of the nations of the earth, that they are a, a special chosen people of God, and that God, in their eyes, that they are a jewel to God, and they're more special than you. Let that sink in. And the black Hebrew Israelites have tried to adopt this false teaching, whereas, wherein they go so far as to, as to take the star of David. And you'll even see these people with the star of David on their chest or the star of David on their, on their head. But here's a problem. That's not the star of David, buddy. There's no such thing as the star of David in the Bible. Do you know what star that, that the Israelites had? Do you know what star that the Jews had? Remember, they were a disobedient and a gainsaying people. They had the star of Molech. That's what they had. They had the star of Remphan. So these, these black Hebrew Israelites, you know what they've done? They've adopted... A, uh, a, 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 a false teaching, a false doctrine that wherein is, is damning many other people to hell. You know who? All the Jews. They're all going to hell. Do you know why? Because they think just by, just by nature of who they are, of their, of their skin color, that they are just special to God. I mean, that is, a, there are many sects in Judaism today that truly believe that. Because we are of the line of Abraham, that's enough for us. Because we are of the line of Abraham, God will show mercy on us because we have the blessing of Abraham. And you have other people who have adopted these false teachings. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible cared about Naaman the Syrian as much as he did every other Israelite. The God of the Bible cared about that widow in Sarepta or Zarephath just as much as he did as every other widow in any other nation on the world. It doesn't matter whether that woman would have been... <coughs> It doesn't matter where she would have lived. He would have cared about her, even if she would have been of Israel. You know, he just, you know what he does? He just cares about the world. For God so loved the world. Amen. You know what the New Testament is? Honestly, because the, the Jews rejected by and large the Lord Jesus Christ and, and Christianity and the gospel, the New Testament is basically just a record of God you know, giving the gospel to the entire world just in mass numbers. That was actually Israel's job in the Old Testament. That passage that I quoted from Luke 2 where it says, A light to light in the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be salvation unto the ends of the earth, that's quoted about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Now obviously Israel, that seed, is Christ. So it's, it's, it's fulfilled in Christ. But the temporary application was that, that Israel was to be a light to lighten the world. They actually took this as, we're just greater than everyone else. You know, we have the message of salvation, and you know what they did? They hid the light. Instead of putting the light on a hill, right? Instead of letting the light shine and going forth and preaching the gospel to all of the Gentiles, they, they just took the light and then they just, you know, that just puffed them up and caused them to think that they were greater than all the nations of the world. That's ridiculous. Man. God loves everyone. Race means nothing. Skin color means nothing. That's not the God of the Bible. I want you to turn to, <coughs> let's look at some Old Testament passages. So, uh, uh, go to Isaiah 11, <coughs> 10, chapter number 11, verse number 10. I apologize for my cough this morning. <coughs> Isaiah chapter number 11, we'll look at another example of this. Verse number 10, we saw even Jesus quoting Old Testament passages. We saw a couple of other prophecies that were prophesied of uh, the, the Gentiles being saved, God loving the Gentiles, salvation of the Gentiles. I want you to look with me here at uh, Isaiah chapter number 11, verse number 10. It says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Go to Isaiah chapter number 60, verse number 3. <clears throat> I'll read it to you. Go to Isaiah 49, 6 actually. We got a few in Isaiah here I wanted to look at. <clears throat> Isaiah 63, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. <clears throat> Isaiah 49, 6 says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. Watch this. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation. Look at this. Unto the end of the earth. What's he talking about? Bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. Everyone. All the way to the end of any port, part of dry land. That's what he's saying. Any tribe that lives on the verge. Just, you know, the, the fringe of wherever it may be. Asia. Wherever it may be. Islands out there. Uh, he wants everyone to receive the gospel. He wanted everyone to, to hear the, the gospel. <clears throat> we have the example of Rahab the harlot. 
Joshua 6.25, And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Do you notice that? She dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Do you know what Rahab was in a very general sense? She was a Canaanite. She was a Canaanite. She lived in the area right there of Canaan. As soon as they crossed the river, that was the first place that they destroyed. It was Jericho, right? She was a Canaanite. She dwelled, what was that in that time? The land of Canaan. You know what happened? She lived in Israel unto this day. Do you think she had children? I'm sure that she did. Do you know what happened with Rahab? She became a Jew. That's what happened. Esther 8.17 applied to Rahab. She became a Jew and then multiple generations went by and nobody even knew that she was of Jericho, right? It's just like with Jesus. Where was Ruth up? She was a Moabite. There's so many examples of this. Um, go back to the New Testament now. <coughs> this is actually probably going to be the, the last place that we look. Uh, John chapter number 4, verse number 19. Let's go to John chapter number 4, verse number 19. So people will try to say, you know, Jesus, that he, uh, Jesus, he, he, he denied salvation to the Gentiles. You know, Jesus, he, he didn't want, the, sal he didn't want uh, the Gentiles to be saved. Now, number one, Jesus is the one that sent his disciples to all nations. He's the one that said, Jesus is Lord, my friend. So we're proving that God wants everyone to be saved, that God loves all nations. He loves the Gentiles. When we prove that Jesus loved the Gentiles. Jesus commanded them, we saw, to go into all nations. Jesus is the one that is said to be a light to the Gentiles. He is a light to the Gentiles. Not only that, as we saw earlier, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus was of Moabite descent himself. Jesus was a Moabite. Can you imagine him saying that you know, he, he, he doesn't want the Moabites to be saved, he hates the Moabites, when he himself is a Moabite? It's ridiculous. Obviously, he's of the nation of Judah. He came of, uh, he's of the nation of Israel, which became Judah, of course. But he's of the line of Judah as far as his lineage. By and large, he, came, he was a part of that tribe, his father's line and everything. But if you trace his line down in one angle, because if you look at your ancestry, it can, you can go all over the place, right? Do you know where one angle that took you? you know where one little turn you could take? Ruth. You know where she came from? A couple of Moabites who came from a Moabites in the, in the land of Moab. You're just choosing where you want to go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Jesus loves all. Now, people will say, oh, you know, uh, I, I just want to use one small example uh, in the Bible, and I want to give you a spiritual application here at the end. But I want to give a, a small example where people, people actually bring this up to say that uh, Jesus you know, didn't want the Gentiles to be saved. He didn't want any of the uh, any one of the other nations of the world uh, to be saved. And what they will bring up is <clears throat> how Jesus told his disciples when he was on this earth. He said, you know, uh, not to go into any of the other nations. He said, not even in Samaria, right? He didn't tell them to go into Samaria. He said, but go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, the reason why was because Jesus had a particular mission during his life. Because what does he say as soon as he raises from the dead? He says, hey, he, he actually says the words, go into Samaria, doesn't he? Samaria, he says Judea, Samaria, and then you know what he says next? Into the uttermost parts of the earth. He had a, he had a specific job during that time, and obviously he was fulfilling the fact that he was going to be, he was going to Israel, and he knew that he would be rejected by Israel. So, number one, he was preaching the gospel to all of the nation of Israel while he was there, which would, in turn, would, would cause him to be crucified. He was taken and then rejected by the Jews because of that. So, that was a part of why he was doing that, right? Was to preach the gospel to all of Israel, make sure that everyone in Israel gets to hear the gospel, but also he knew that he would be taken by wicked hands, of course. So, he, by doing that... He fulfilled him being him dying on the cross. But then once he died, he was buried, he rose again. Then he came back. Hey, that's fulfilled. That job's fulfilled. You know, my death, my burial, my resurrection is fulfilled. Now go preach it to the entire world. Makes perfect sense. But people will turn to John chapter number 4 about the Samaritan woman and, and try to say, uh, they'll try to teach that, um, you know, Jesus, you know, he, he didn't want the, the, the Samaritans to be saved. Now, I, wanna, I just want to focus on a couple of verses, th these, these two verses that people will use and just show a comparison between a couple of texts. And then I'm going to show you one more text and we're going to end with, like I said, a spiritual application. But if anyone knows this passage well, what happens? 
she gets saved. Mm -hmm. And then you know what else happens? A ton of Samaritans come and get saved. She goes to her village of Samaria and tons of people come and get saved. And Jesus tells them in this passage, look at this real quick. I just want to look at this quick passage. Verse 35, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Do you know what he's talking about? Because this woman had went and told all of the nation, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And you know what happens? These people are like flooding. They're coming, and he's telling them, lift up your eyes. You know, for, for they're white already unto harvest. Say not, there are yet four months. What is it, four months? I think it says four months, and then cometh harvest. He says it's white already unto harvest. Look, lift up your eyes. You know what that probably is going on? There's probably a bunch of Samaritans. He's telling them to look at something. Yeah, you know, there's probably that there are a bunch of Samaritans that are already that are walking towards him right then. And he's telling them, "Hey, go preach them the gospel." Talking to those that are Samaritans about those that are Samaritans. But I want to show you the true interpretation of a verse here that people will try to rip out of context here in John chapter number four. <coughs> look at verse. Look at verse number. Uh, let's begin in verse number nineteen says this. This is a Samaritan woman speaking. It says this. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she's drawing this distinction right now between herself and the Jews. I don't know if you understand that. But look at verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So what people will focus on there, of course, is verse number 22, where Jesus says, Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews the Jews. Now when she draws that line in verse number 20, she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. I don't believe when she says our fathers that she's specifically just speaking. She's, draw, she's drawing a, a, a line here and she's explaining something, but I don't believe that she's just talking about Samaritans. Do you know where they're located right now is where? It's at Jacob's well. Okay? So, do you know who lived in that area were the, what? The Syrians, right? The, all the Syrians lived in the area where Samaritan, Sam, Samaria was located later. Do you know what ancestor that all of Samaria and Israelites would link back to? Now, the Samarians were mixed and mingled later on. They were, they were basically a group that they were a part of. The, they were Jews, right? And then they basically broke off to another nation. And they just like basically started their own nation and just like gave no heed to the nation of, of Judah. It's basically those of Israel, right? That later became Israel. The late Israel. Okay? So, what father do they have in common? Jesus and the, Samar and the Samaritan woman. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Where are they located right now? Jacob's well. This is where Jacob and them would... She's saying our fathers, like mine and your father. You know, and I'm pretty sure I could be wrong about this. I'm pretty sure in Stephen Anderson's film, didn't he say like, he explained like this thing, like the Samaritans, they came up on this mountain. I'm almost positive. Maybe I'm being a false accuser right now. But I think he tried to say like, up on this mountain, they would go up here, all the Samaritans, what she's talking about. That's when you get into history, that's when you start making all these mistakes. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. She, he's saying our, she's saying our fathers. She's talking to Jesus. It's third person plural. She's saying our fathers worshipped in the mountain. She's saying, but the Jews say, like my father, Jacob, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Why are you telling me that I would have to go there? That's what she's saying. Into Jerusalem. Couldn't I just worship where Jacob and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worshipped? That's what she's saying. Now, then she goes on to say, verse 20, then he goes on to say afterwards, Jesus saith that her woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Then he says this. This is what people will focus on. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So people say, oh, see, salvation is of the Jews. It's for the Jew. And you know what they're thinking of when they say Jew? They're thinking of a race, right? Those that don't understand what the word Jew means even in a physical sense when it's a nation. But that's not even what Jesus means here. He's not talking about a physical nation either. 
Look at the next verse. He says in verse 23, But the hour cometh, and watch this, and now is. Notice that. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father, watch this, in spirit and in truth. What, what line was she trying to divide a moment ago where it seemed like he was making? A line of flesh. Do you know what he just explained who the true worshipers were? The true worshipers are those that worship in what? But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Those that are doing what? Worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And, and the context is, is a discussion about like flesh and nations, right? Look at the next verse. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Go to, uh, keep your hand here and go to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. <coughs> Philippians chapter number 3. To understand the Bible, the, you have to compare spiritual things with spiritual. You have to use the Bible to define the Bible. I want you to look at Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 2. J Paul, who is a Jew himself, physically, he's physically a Jew, he's of the nation of the Jews, right? He even says that he could trace his line back. If you want to talk about lineages, to where? Trace it all the way back to Abraham. That's what he says, right? Well, look at Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 2. Watch what Paul says. <clears throat> Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, the word concision right there, that's the same word as circumcision. He's talking about the Jews. But look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Now, for there means because. So he's saying, beware of the circumcision. Like those that say they are the circumcision. You know what he's saying? Beware of the Jews. Why? Because we are the circumcision. What's he saying? We are the Jews. Look at what it says next. So, verse 3, uh, verse three one more time. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So notice what verse number 2 says and notice who he's writing to. These are Gentiles in Philippi. And he says, we, talking about, Jew, talking about Gentiles and Jew, we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, and have no confidence in the flesh. What did Jesus say was the Jew and who was going to worship him? Said in 23, 4.23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now a person that worships, worships him in spirit is what? He said, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. What did Jesus say? In Chapter number twenty, or, uh, chapter four of twenty-two, that people try to twist all the time. For salvation is of the Jews. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the true Jew, my friend. He's talking about the, about the person that's not putting confidence in the flesh, but it's a worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Turn to Romans chapter two, verse twenty-eight. Romans chapter number two, verse number twenty-eight. Once you understand that the nation, or that the, that a Jew <coughs> in the Bible <coughs> is a nation, and it is not even a race. That's a big step into understanding other aspects of the Bible. But even if you were of the nation, physical nation of Israel, or physical nation of the Jews, that's not what should be sought after. That's still not what's important. You need to be of the nation of God. And in the New Testament, my friend, the nation of God is not a physical nation. It is a spiritual nation. Right. It is those that rejoice in Christ Jesus, as Philippians 3 said. It is those that have no confidence in the flesh. It's those that are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 2, look at verse 28. Notice what it says. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one outwardly inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and of the spirit. You notice the consistency there? And not in the letter whose praise is not of men and of God. You know what Jesus Christ was explaining to her? Hey, the physical doesn't matter. 
He said, the time is com- he said the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship God in the spirit, right? True worshipers are going to worship God in, the, in spirit and in truth. He's telling them, hey, you don't, you don't need to go in the mountain. You don't need to go in Jerusalem. Why? Because that's not what matters. What matters is that you are circumcised of the heart. That's what matters. Like Paul said, we are the circumcision. You know, you know who he's talking about? You know who Paul lumped himself in with? He said, we are the circumcision. Saying, me, I'm a physical Jew, and you a Gentile. Do you know, who's, you know, who's Paul, you know who Paul's allegiance was with? It wasn't like, hey, you know, uh, I'm a white man, so I'm, my people are white people. That's, that wasn't Paul. Right. He wasn't saying, hey, I'm black, so all my people are the black people. Or, hey, I'm Filipino, right? All my people are the Filipino. That doesn't matter. Right. Paul is saying, hey, we are the circumcision. You know who his people were? They were the people of God. I have more in common with someone that is a Christian that grew up on the other side of the world that is the total opposite skin color than me than I would have with my own physical brother if he was not of the Spirit and of the truth. What matters is that we are of God. The ma- what matters is that we are children of God. That is what matters. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, I, I want to end this kind of... That would have been a good ending right there, but I want to give you an interpretation of a verse that people will... It's a very funny interpretation. Uh, or, or, it's an interpretation that people are wrong about, but the answer is actually very funny uh, because it's, it's teaching that physical Jews today that are not saved, that they are actually Gentiles. Here in Romans chapter number 2, I want you to look up. First, I'll begin <coughs> with what he's saying here in the context. It says in, in uh, verse number 17, chapter 2, the chapter that we're in, Romans 2, 17, he says this, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law. Now, who rests in the law? Physical Jews, right? And notice what he said, thou art called a Jew. So this person's called a Jew, aren't they? So he's talking about a physical Jew, but also I want you to notice how he worded that. You are what? You're called a Jew. So that's just the beginning. Skip down now, Romans chapter 2. Look at verse number 23. Thou makest thy boast of the law. Notice he said they rest in the law before, right? So he says, thou makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law. Thou that makest thy boast, I'm sorry, thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law Dishonorest thou God? Now watch this, talking to the Jew. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Now most people say that the interpretation of this is that, that the Jews are causing those that are physical Gentiles to blaspheme God. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying that the name of God is blasphemed through them because, because they are a Gentile. And I'll prove that to you. Look one more time at verse number 24, and then we're going to read verse 25. For the name of God is, but is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. That means by. The word by and through are uh, interchangeable. Those are the same words. So you can do something by something or through something. Through you. And now watch what he explains. He explains it to you. As it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. Saying, it profits if you were to be able to keep the whole law. That's what he's explaining in this chapter. But watch this. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made, look at this, uncircumcision. Do you know who the circumcised are called? You know what's used interchangeable? Circumcision and Jew. Do you know who those that are uncircumcised are called? They're called Gentiles. Do you know what he's explaining? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. How? As it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou be a keeper of the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision, Jew, old Jew, is made uncircumcision. You know what that means? Do you know who the true Jew is in the first place, my friend? It's those that are believers in Christ. Because nobody could keep the law. Right. But you know what happened? I put my faith in Christ and he kept the law. Right. And I'm given his righteousness, my friend. Amen. And now I'm a true Jew. And I worship the Lord. I worship God in spirit and in truth. 
and I have no confidence in the flesh, and neither or nor should you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, that you're not a respecter of persons, that we don't have a sadistic, weird God that looks upon the color of our skin and makes decisions based 